Happy Wednesday, everyone. Welcome to this month's Water Wednesday. My name is Yilin Zhuang. I'm the Water Resources Regional Specialized Agent in UFIFS Extension Central District. If it's, this is the, your first time turning into Water Wednesday, you may wonder what is Water Wednesday? Water Wednesday is uh, a webinar series we live stream on both Facebook Live and Zoom. So we may have attendees now on Facebook. We will also have attendees on Zoom webinar. And every Wednesday or every two Wednesday, every the other Wednesday, we will host a 30 minute webinar uh, uh, focusing on Florida's water. And today we will discuss how can I be a good stormwater neighbor. And today's uh, guest speaker is the water agent uh, in Marion County, Gabriel Vicari. So now let's welcome Gabriel. All righty, so I guess I could start by sharing my screen. Maybe. Oh, yeah, go ahead. there we yeah. go. Mm -hmm. All right, is my computer cooperating? Can everybody see that? Still showing uh, a black screen, said a started sharing screen, but we don't see anything yet. Uh oh. Oh, hold on with oh my computer froze it happens <laughs> i feel like computers are usually fail on us when we need them yeah. okay also true for technology <laughs> <laughs> so please bear with us so while gabriel is figuring out how to make his computer wake up. So if you are watching our <laughs> webinar series, please tell us where you are watching this live stream because that's the beauty of a webinar. So you can be everywhere. So last time we have we had some attendees from other countries and was telling me it was one o'clock in the morning. So I was really amazed by that. So tell us where you are. Are you in Florida? Uh, let me check my Facebook. Hey, Bill, we have Dr. Lester, the Hernando County Horticulture Agent, and he's from Spring Hill. And I know Dr. Lester has a plant clinic every Thursday. And thank you for joining us. Oh, great. Now I can see it, but you probably want to switch the mode now it's the presenter mode oh geez okay and one thing after another, another huh what a wednesday what a water wednesday <laughs> <laughs> here let me stop the share really quick and then try again okay how's that one beautiful Okay, finally. <laughs> Jeez, that was terrible. My, so my computer just sat there for about five minutes. But uh, cool, hopefully we're working now. Alrighty, so as Yulin mentioned, um, I am the UFIFIS Extension Marion County Water Resources Agent. And today we're going to cover how can we be a good stormwater neighbor. And so I thought this picture, actually hold on one second, let me get my laser pointer here. Um, I thought this picture would be a good summary for that. So this may be your yard uh, having some flooding issues after a rainstorm, or maybe this is your neighbor's yard and uh, you had a, some rain and it, and it flooded in their yard from your yard. And so we're going to talk about ways today that we can um, kind of maneuver around this situation and, and decrease this from happening. So, oops, there we go. First, let's look at some fun facts here. And uh, for example, the amount of water that can come off of our impervious surfaces in just a 200 square foot house, like our roof and our driveway, it can generate around 1200 gallons of water. 
and then multi multiply that by our 40 to 60 inches of rain per year. That ends up being about 50 to 75,000 gallons of water. And for me, those kinds of numbers are, are really difficult to comprehend. So I try to break it down in a way that we can uh, a mental image, get a good mental image of it. And here uh, I did that. So over 1,055 gallon drums is this number right here. And so even that for me is a little difficult to imagine. Uh, you know, a thousand of those drums is a lot of water. And so knowing that you can imagine just off of one house, 2,000 square foot roof, um, this much water in a year gets generated that would otherwise be trying to percolate into the ground and then multiply that by an entire neighborhood. So now we're seeing lots of water that would normally be going into the groundwater is actually um, flowing across our impervious surfaces. And so that kind of answered this question, what is stormwater? And so that's all this, all the rain and that runs off of our impervious surfaces like rooftops, driveways, roads, parking lots, uh, even our turf grass. Once it reaches our, uh, its moisture capacity, the water just runs across the surface instead of uh, percolates into the ground. And so who cares about that? Uh, well, your neighbor could, um, and if your water's running off into their property and causing flooding issues, or maybe you're that unfortunate neighbor that's getting flooded. And uh, so that's a big part of it. And, uh, but really we all do. And so all that water needs to go somewhere. And we don't want our, our suburban or urban areas to look like this. And so stormwater infrastructure has been designed into these communities to make sure this doesn't happen and that we can still use those impervious surfaces to walk on and drive on. So that, that infrastructure that's built into this is stuff that you're all probably familiar with. Um, culverts here, this is a side drain. There's also retention ponds, storm ponds, uh, detention basins, and then underground piping that moves that all around. So while this is a really incredible feat of engineering, you got to ask yourself, where does that water go? And it really ends up in our local water bodies or in our surficial groundwater, which initially is, sounds like a good thing, right? That water is recharging our groundwater. And so that's a place where we get a lot of our drinking water um, or it moves into our surficial waters, which might be recharging ponds or rivers or streams. Um, but unfortunately, along with it, it can carry herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, animal wastes from that neighbor who never picks up the dog poop, um, hydrocarbons, which is like a fancy name for just like fuels and lubricants that, are, that come off of our vehicles, and other stuff, litter, trash, um, sediment even can be an issue in our stormwater systems, and then eventually in, dumped into our water bodies. So this infrastructure exists to protect our neighborhoods and our cities but what, we, what can we do on our own properties to protect local water quality and reduce flooding? And that really is managing rainfall at the source. And so we want to trap and store it on site and try to get it to percolate into the ground instead of moving and traveling long distances across these impervious surfaces and collecting contaminants along the way. So just like this picture, you kind of want to think this nice um, green area with a lot of um, large trees, a lot of wildlife and some uh, plants and animals. So that's going to do a lot more to, well, maybe not the animals, but at least the plants is going to do a lot more to control that rainwater and that stormwater than this situation here, where you just see it flowing a long distance and eventually into our stormwater systems. And so ways to do that would be rainwater harvesting, uh, downspout planters, dry bioretention, uh, tree canopy, impermeable or uh, permeable pavements, dry wells. And so we'll spend the next few minutes looking at each one of these in particular. So first rainwater harvesting, which is one of my personal favorites. Um, I like to tinker with these things and build them. Um, I've built a lot of these. I actually haven't graduated to building my own cistern collection system yet, but uh, it's on the list. And uh, the cool thing about rainwater is you're collecting that impervious or that rain that comes off those impervious surfaces and you're storing it right there on site. And it's a source of clean, soft water. Um, it's usually used for irrigation in your yard. 
but there's some areas in uh, the western part of the nation that have got it figured out. They're using it for toilet flushing, clothes washing, car washing, emergency use, and even potable use. Uh, but what just a disclaimer on that, make sure if you decide to take on a project like that, uh, you're familiar with your county and city requirements um, for ordinance and permitting for that because public health is taken really care really seriously. And so make sure you do that right. And then also just to add, it's a lot cheaper than municipal water. And so a lot of work's put into delivering water to your house uh, that's at drinking water levels. And it's a little bit of a shame that it ends up, half of it ends up going out to our turf grass. And so replacing that with rainwater that's harvested from your rooftop is, is a great opportunity. Alrighty, so bioretention. Um, this is a really interesting I would say new, but it's it's not too new, but it's just gaining popularity. And so this is a rain garden, um, but really what bioretention is, is uh, a way to reduce runoff, remove pollutants, and increase native plant species in the area. And it's really just either an already low spot in your lawn or a, a spot where you've dug out and you divert all the water to. And all there's soil on top of gravel and the gravel provides an area below that soil to store a lot of water. And then um, it planted in that soil above it are a lot of plant species that like to keep their feet wet. They're plants that enjoy um, either moist conditions or keep the ones that like to keep their feet wet. And uh, three examples here we're gonna cover in the next few slides. And they're all vegetative swales or bioswales. We'll see next rain gardens, which this is a cross section of, and then dow spot planters, which are just pretty much a smaller version of a rain garden. Alrighty, so vegetative swale. This I thought was a really cool and a really great example. Um, so all of the water that comes off of this facility here, concrete down the stairs, off the rooftops gets moved into this landscaped area by this soil. So the vegetation, rocks, and the mulch slow that water flow and encourage its infiltration down into the ground instead of moving across the landscape. Um, but this, since it's a soil, it's kind of multifunctional. So it's used to move that water, but at the same time, it's gonna treat those pollutants, slow that water down, and encourage that groundwater recharge that I spoke about earlier. And then also the plants and the mulch are gonna absorb some of that water and allow it to evaporate. And so the one thing to remember with all the bioretention that we're gonna go over in the next few slides is that it's gonna require that maintenance. There's gonna be periodic sediment removal. Um, sometimes plants need to be replaced or reseeded. And also if you have a really heavy rain event, it might end up causing some erosion in some areas. So you might have to replace that as well. Um, but like any garden, especially one that looks this cool, uh, I think that's a small price to pay. Alrighty, so this is a really interesting example of a rain garden. This is um, downspout hooked to buried piping. In this picture, it's not buried yet. And then it ends up going into this rain garden here. And again, if you remember that uh, a couple of slides before, below all this is gravel that can store a lot of that water. And then on top of that gravel is some plant species and some mulch. And so again, you wanna have that water toler tolerant trees and shrubs in there. And they have a large pollution, pollution removal potential. So um, in some studies, they see 90, 95 to 90% of the metals absorbed by the plants and nitrogen and phosphorus as well, plants and microbial activity um, did that work in the rain garden. So I thought that was really impressive. And also, again, uh, like I mentioned in the last slide, that uh, maintenance, periodic plant replacement, addition of mulch, and um, some of that drainage pipe might need to be maintained over time. But again, small price to pay. I think this looks really cool. Alrighty, um, downspout planters. And so these I actually had never heard of. Um, and so these are, are really cool. They're pretty much like a stormwater barrel or a, a rain barrel and a garden kind of in one. And so this one in particular has uh, storage underneath. And this two by two by four one can store over 50 gallons of water. And then there's soil on the top. And so that provides uh, habitat for wildlife. It's kind of a miniature garden. And so the downspout flows into this 
and then drains through the soil and fills up this basin here. Once it starts to overflow so that it doesn't waterlog that soil, it has a chance to overflow out. It could go either into another pot, into a rain garden, or um, into the turf grass. So it's, these are pretty cool. And this one is actually on a really large scale. This is a school project and the roof um, delivers water to this here. And there's again, the storage underneath for all that extra water. And this one in particular was cool because they had rope wicks that go from the soil into the reservoir below. And so in the wet part of the year, it collects water. And in the dry part of the year, uh, through capillary action, that water wicks back up the rope into the soil. And so I thought that was a really clever thing. And um, it's a cool thing to have a garden like that and not have to irrigate or irrigate minimally. And again, provides a wildlife habitat. And that's something I forgot to add for all the bioretention, rain garden and the swales is all a good area for wildlife to hang out in. Alrighty, so dry wells and underground infiltration. So these are more for the folks that don't want to install um, gardens and, and deal with all that, but they still would like to store some of that water and encourage infiltration into the ground instead of all of that water traveling along the surface and collecting those contaminants we talked about. And so a dry well is essentially just a rock filled hole and uh, that the pore, the open pore space between all those rocks stores a lot of water. And so that encourages the water to fill up in this basin and then slowly percolate, percolate into the ground after that. And uh, so these are really great options. Sometimes they're in a low spot in the property already with just a drain on top. Other times they're like in this picture connected to a downspout where all of that fills in. I added this picture, it's a little hard to see, but this guy pretty much built a dry well network throughout his um, yard. And so if you look really here, really close, there's a vent, or not a vent, uh, a grate where the water in the low spot can go into this per perforated pipe. And then the downspout also connects to that. And then surrounding all of that is all of that rock where the water can get stored in the pore space. So it drains down here or drains into this spot and then fills all this up and over time it slowly percolates into the ground. Uh, one thing I want to note with dry wells and uh, percolation technologies like this is that you need appropriate soil. So if you have a really clay soil or clay lawn, you want to be careful. You might end up building all of this and it stores water, but once it reaches capacity and it can't drain through that clay, then you're back to having a flooded yard. And so you got to be careful. Uh, but benefits to all of this is pretty much uh, any of the benefits that are kind of over the blanket part of this is, is storing that water on site and then reducing erosing, erosion as that water travels across the ground. Alrighty, next would be permeable pavement. And so this is a really cool option for um, folks that are maybe trying to put a path from their gazebo to their back porch. Uh, you definitely don't want to um, see this slide and go and uh, break up your driveway. Most of us already have concrete driveways in, so we can't do anything about that. Um, but if you're trying to add on in any areas, permeable pavement's a good option. And so this also slows water down, encourages it to infiltrate into the ground. And um, there's all kinds of different types. So there's interlocking pavers here. There's this asphalt, which uh, porous asphalt is something I'm not as familiar with, but it's an option. Uh, the concrete is really cool. I've actually messed around with this a lot. And uh, once you get the mix down, it's pretty, pretty cool and, and pretty easy to handle. These are interlocking pavers um, or concrete grid pavers with sand in them. And so they also encourage a lot of the water to drain through. And like this picture, they can also be planted with seed. And so you can kind of have like a live pavement. Same with this one. This is plastic reinforcing grid. And if you look really close, you can see these little hexagons. Um, here they put some um, topsoil in and then seeded that. And so it's kind of like a living pavement area, which, and, which can support traffic and pedestrian 
And um, that's the whole reason that you would choose maybe permeable pavement over a rain garden, right? You still want to store some water, but you don't want people walking through your rain garden. So these are options. And uh, this one was really cool too. So these are the two, the same materials, but this one here is filled with rock instead of the, the living landscape here. And uh, so in terms of filtering the stormwater for pollutants, it's better for sediment, not as much for um, any of the pollutants like fertilizers and herbicides, um, except for this one. If this one has like the microbes and, and the living, the turf grass in it, it's going to do a little more to absorb some of those um, contaminants. And then they also store a lot of water. And so depending on the porosity, these, except for the pavers, are all between 25 to 40% porosity. And so if you do some math, a 10 by 10 square, that's a half of a foot deep, so six inches deep, can store 25% porosity, can store about 12 cubic feet. And up to 40% will store 20 cubic feet. So that's another one of those that I don't really, you know, it's kind of hard to imagine. So I went back to the 55 gallon drum example. Uh, a 55 gallon drum can store about 7.35 cubic feet. So this 40% porosity here can store almost three of those rain barrels. And so and that's just a 10 by 10 square space. And so I think that's a pretty, pretty interesting as well and a great option. Already tree canopy. And so having really massive trees, of course, is not something you can't just go to a landscape or a nursery and buy a big tree. Uh, that would not, not really be effective. Um, but having these in your neighborhood already or planting them and um, encouraging the neighborhood or the HOA to plant them is a good thing. It'll really pay off in the future. So just from water clinging to the canopy of the plant, you can, or of the tree, you can absorb 15 to 20% of the water that falls on those leaves, which is pretty substantial if you, if you have a really big um, canopy here. And then within one acre of urban forest, so I, I would assume maybe an acre could be throughout an entire neighborhood. Uh, there's studies that show that they absorb up to 82% of the nitrogen. And so if nitrogen, excess nitrogen is considered a pollutant. And so that's a, that's a pretty substantial amount of storage as well. And of course, um, plants, trees especially, uh, use CO2 and release oxygen. And so that's gonna do a lot for our air quality. And also the canopy is gonna shade our neighborhoods. And so that's gonna help keep air temperatures down and um, kind of act as an insulation for your house. So, and wildlife habitat, of course, any of these living things that we talk about, not the permeable pavement or the um, dry wells and infiltrators, but everything else provides that habitat for wildlife, for pollinators. And so it's an ancillary benefit to a lot of these. And then last, I want to talk about this study in California that I found was really impressive. Uh, 2,600 trees absorb 99 million gallons of water. And again, that's uh, another volume of water that's hard to conceive. And so I broke that down per year and that was 38,000 gallons a year. And that was actually on the low end of what was reported in this study. It depends on the tree size and uh, the variety, uh, but 38,000 gallons a year just in storage is, is a great number. So these are all really great options that you can use in your property to keep that water on site and have it percolate into the ground instead of collect those contaminants. Alrighty, so stormwater ponds. I wanted to add this just because um, if you're lucky enough to be a neighbor to a stormwater pond, you probably don't have a lot of issues in terms of flooding in your neighborhood or on your property because your property is naturally graded to send that water into the pond. Uh, but when I talk to a lot of landscape professionals and HOAs, a lot of the folks that live along stormwater ponds don't like the plants. Um, they want to get rid of them. They want turf grass all the way up to the side of it because they want to see the water. And so I just wanted to touch a little bit on uh, the importance of these stormwater plants or, or plants along the stormwater pond. So first, I'd like to share this before and after. This was a stormwater pond that um, got was in the dry season was really low and had all of this um, 
no vegetation actually. And then it was planted with both littoral, so the plants that like to hang out um, either in the water, completely submerged or along the water's edge, and then with shoreline vegetation. And uh, number one, I think a big benefit of this is just how cool it looks, right? It looks um, a lot more, just looks beautiful. It looks great here. And uh, also, you're going to think about how the amount of water that would move through here would stir up so much sediment in this pond compared to having plants here that kind of act as a filter and hold the shoreline in place. So let's look at that a little closer. Uh, we already talked about the definitions of these, but the shoreline plants are the ones that are up along the side of the bank. And so they do a lot to hold that soil in place and keep erosion from happening. And so as water increases, or as uh, water flow across that area increases, it would erode the pond and make it bigger. And uh, even though the pond gets bigger, it would fill in with sediment. So it would end up becoming shallower at the same time. And so those shoreline plants help to uh, keep that in position, hold that soil in place. They also slow uh, water flow. And so as water flows really quickly into the pond, it would stir up a lot of sediment at the bottom of the pond and make it cloudy. So it, when they slow that water down, it helps with water clarity. They also filter debris and trash. And so you can look at these this muley grass here and imagine the water flowing through it and maybe some trash uh, from the neighborhood or from a fast food joint is uh, flowing along with the water. This would stop it from getting into the pond. And as you could see here, like the leaves are doing would accumulate at the bottom and allow it to be um, thrown away before it made it into the pond. And then they also absorb nutrients. So as that water flows through, it slows down, it gets encouraged to go down into the ground instead of move into the um, stormwater pond. And in doing so, it's going to take some of those nutrients that it's carrying with it into the ground and into the plant. So that's the benefit of some of the shoreline plants. And then the littoral plants were those ones that were underwater or in the, in the deeper water. And uh, so they have the ability to absorb pollutants from inside the water column. And, uh, as the bigger the pond, the more the plants, uh, the more absorption is going to happen. They also hold those underwater sediments in place. And so when I talked about the water flowing really quickly down the side of the bank um, from like a huge storm event, for example, and stirring all that sediment up, if these are in place holding that sediment down, you'll have less of that. And so you'll see less of that water sediment getting cloudy. Also, you have uh, habitat, so it's really important. You can imagine how many fish would like to hang out under here, insects, and uh, the more fish we have, the less mosquitoes we have, and so that's a really great benefit, as well as they shade and cool the water, and so you can see how much sun that this is blocking, and so um, cooler, cooler water means more oxygen, and oxygen is beneficial for both the fish and the microbes. Microbes use that oxygen as energy. And in doing so, they break down a lot of those nutrients that are found in the water column. So these littoral and shoreline plants have a massive benefit. So I'd like to, I'd like to always talk about those any chance I get. And that's so that people have the opportunity to understand the role they play and don't try to get their landscaper to weed whack them all down. Alrighty, and that was actually, I finished a little early, maybe I was talking too fast, um, but uh, I have a few more slides for you. Um, I really want to encourage y'all to share your, your photos, and so if you end up going after any of these projects and doing so, maybe go with like a before and after picture. Uh, we love to see our impacts and love to see what, what kind of projects y'all do, and it allows us to share some of your great ideas and um, inspire some others. And so this one I thought was really cool. This is a rain barrel, but it also has what's called a rain chain. And so, and say you don't have a downspout, but you still have an area where a lot of water pools and comes off this corner of your roof, you can mount a rain chain and the water um, follows this rain chain down into the rain barrel. And so it focuses that water to be collected in one area instead of spraying all over the yard and causing erosion in this corner. And then this was just a, a really cool small scale rain garden I saw. And so you see the downspout filling into this and then you have all these really healthy plants. So again, share your project photos with us. Uh, we'd love to see that. 
And then last, I just have this list of additional references. And I know that all of these links here aren't going to work for you all. So I will, I have them all pulled up on a separate document. I can put them in the chat for you. So if you guys want to go into a deep dive about any of this stuff we talked about, um, these links have, some of them even have links inside of them that um, you can read about. So I hope everyone enjoyed that. And uh, um, let me stop my screen share in here. Thank you, Gabriel. And while you were talking, I was dropping all the links oh, <laughs> on cool. the chat okay. box. Some might be different from your source because I'm very interested into that uh, downsprout planters. So I was searching. I didn't find anything from Florida. So I put uh, another extension material in the chat box. I glanced your material, uh, like the link. It was not from Florida either. So just... Just curious, have you thought, like noticed anything like that in Florida? I have seen it's uh, not actually a downspot planter like the one I showed, but it's a rain barrel and it has a planter on top of it. And so mm -hmm. it's like a little bit, it was more of the barrel and less of the planter. Um, but I thought that was really cool. But my link was, let me double check mine really quick. Oh, I can't get it to open. Man, my computer is really struggling today. My, mine was from Charles River Watershed Association, which is also okay. not Florida. Yeah, because um, I don't know. It's because uh, of what I'm thinking, the downsprout, because for Florida, it's, we have really seasonal rainfall. So for the dry season, like, well, the wet season, like a three inch storm, too much water for oh, the... Yeah. For the garden, or like we probably have the whole winter only have half an inch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I like the benefit of the uh, water underneath and then the wicks that were wicking that water up and into the soil throughout the dry season, as long as the water lasted that long. I thought that was a really clever thing. Yeah, that's great. Um, just like Gabriel said, we'd like to see your pictures. So if you can post your pictures. Uh, I know it's hard for our Zoom attendees, it's hard to upload pictures, so, but for our Facebook viewers, so if you can drop a picture of uh, the cool um, stormwater management project, so we'd like to see it. Because when we say like to be a good stormwater neighbor, it sounds like really broad, but just like Gabriel broke it into small pieces, like a rain garden can be a good stormwater neighbor. And even when you have a rain barrel, it can be a good stormwater management too. So there are a lot of small actions, small steps we can all take. Um, yeah, I'm checking my Facebook, see if we'll, we have anything there. Yeah, I think linking all of these things together can add up to a lot of storage. So if you did the drywall, the dry well and the cistern and then had that go into a rain garden, you're starting to look at a lot of water savings and storage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you also have a pretty garden. Yeah, <laughs> which is a, a huge benefit, especially here, you know, compared to the kind of cookie cutter turf grass, it's really nice to have um, different, different gardens and different things for folks to look at. And it's Florida, you know, you have this, all this sunshine and all this water, you should take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what they say, you can grow everything in Florida with the sunshine, with yeah. the water, it's just, even it's our, our soil, it's all sand. <laughs> yep, sand or clay. <laughs> I don't see any questions on my end. Do you see any questions? I guess you'll cover all of it. Yes, no questions. Either a great thing or a terrible thing. So <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good thing. I just launched a quick question just on the Zoom end. Um, I think the question, I should rephrase it. I said, as a result of this webinar, have you improved your understanding? It should be of being a good stormwater neighbor. So for our Facebook viewers, so, so if you think this 
live streaming, this webinar is helpful. I help you understand, uh, improve your understanding of different uh, stormwater management practices, how to be a good stormwater neighbor. Please like our video and share with others. So I will leave the poll here if you can. Uh, our Zoom attendees, if you can take the poll for us, will be greatly appreciated. And I think that's it. Thank you, everyone, for watching today's uh, Water Wednesday. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. If you watch it on our social media, if you watch it on Facebook, on YouTube, please leave any questions in the comment. Thank you again, um, Gabriel and our attendees. Hope to see you at our next Water Wednesday. Bye now.